Are you ready to turn your investments into retirement income? Listen in as Jeremy Kyle and his guests reveal ways you can make smarter retirement, investment, and tax planning decisions to achieve your ideal retirement. You will learn more about your money so you can feel better about your money and make better money decisions. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Retirement Revealed. I'm your host, Jeremy Kyle, and we're here to turn your retirement savings into a consistent income. We've got a treat today. We've got somebody here, Dr. Larry Kotlikoff. He is a professor of economics at Boston University. He runs a few financial planning software firms. He's even run for president. So Larry, thank you for coming on the show. Great pleasure to be with you. Thanks so so much for having me, Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely. And you ran for president a few years ago. I'm just going to start there because how often do you get to do that? I think we'll have to check the notes, but I'm pretty sure you are the first presidential candidate to be on our podcast. Although what I will say, you are not the first presidential candidate that I've met before. Harry Brown, libertarian, ran for president in 2000. I got to meet him back uh, in the day and he bought me an A&W root beer float. So if I am ever, ever out in uh, Boston there, uh, I'll buy you an A&W root beer float. How's that sound? A&W root beer float is actually my favorite. Um, oh my goodness. Well, that, it must be the, the good candidates running for president. That, that's a good sign. If yeah. that's, That should be in the, uh, the debates. What's your favorite drink? A&W root beer float is, is the right answer, I think. So most of these people run for, you know, you have people that are kind of ideologically oriented towards running for president when they know they have no hope. And then you have like Harold Stassen ran as a Republican candidate about eight times when I was a kid. It was like a laughing running joke. Stassen's running again. But the reason I ran was I thought it was important for the public to hear what economists think we need to do. So I spent about four months talking to people in every different field about how to fix healthcare, social security, tax system, education. And I wrote this up in a platform, which then when I lost the, of course, I lost the election, I put out as this book, um, You're Hired, which is at kotlikoff.net. It's a free download. Anybody can, I think it's an easy read. It's only like hundred pages. And you can see how I and other economists, because I'm really trying to cool to cull together the uh, views of everybody in the profession that makes sense. And we all basically agree on what to do, how to fix social security, how to fix the taxes. I mean, very explicit, 10 bullet long proposals for fixing each of these things that help the education system. I mean, you could provide online education for half the day that's uniform across the country that, that schools could decide whether or not to use. The unions don't want to use the online education that could be placed on the Department of Education website. They don't have to use it, but you go to the Department of Education, there's no no course on geometry, eighth grade geometry available to be used in class throughout the country. We can have, you know, the big problem with our education system is we don't have the quality of education. Here's a way it's absolutely cheap, dirt cheap, zero cost really to provide it. Nobody's doing it. So that's just an example of a very simple solution that can really make a major difference to the future of the country. Yeah, right on. And you've got a lot of those things, like you said, on your website, the Kotlikoff.net. Uh, we'll we'll put that in the show notes, but it's K-O-T-L-I-K-O-F-F.net. And what, what I love about your website, it says on there, fix your finances, fix the country. We'll have people look how to fix the country later on. They can go there. But today we want to talk about how they can fix their own finances. That's your most recent book, Money Magic and Economist Secrets to More Money, Less Risk, and a Better Life. Who doesn't want all three of those things? More money, less risk, better life. Sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing that you, you put in there is a lot of the financial planning that's out there from advisors. I'm a financial advisor. I'm hoping to follow the way that you're, you're talking about here, but you say that a lot of the financial advisors, a lot of financial planning is not based in economics. So you're looking for economics based financial planning. What is that? Well, so economists have been in the business since uh, for about a hundred years of really working in personal financial problems of households, going back to Irving Fisher, who was the top economist in the early 20th, part of the 20th century in the U.S. He was a Yale, Yale economist. Um, and uh, he came up with the idea of consumption smoothing, which is because we uh, kind of get satiated if we consume everything at a point in time. Imagine you had all thousand of the steaks you're going to potentially, um, that you will consume over the rest of your life right in front of you. And you could eat all thousand of them right today. 
you wouldn't need all thousand, right? You would maybe one or two, but the rest you would freeze and hold for the future, just like a squirrel stores up acorns because we get satiated at a point in time, our stomachs get full. The same with our pleasure from any form of consumption. So the idea is not to starve, splurge today and starve tomorrow or starve today and splurge tomorrow. It's to have a smooth living standard. So that underlies that idea of consumption, smoothing, smoothing over time, your living standard, but also over times, good times and bad times. And do that by buying insurance to make sure the bad times aren't so bad and the good times are not so good to diversify your portfolio. Again, the bad when the market crashes, you're not hurt so much as, as you'd otherwise be. It, that idea of consumption smoothing underlies all of economic space, personal finance. And starting about three decades ago, I developed a company to a software company. And we have a tool called maxify.com, which implements economic space financial planning. And we sell it to the public. We also sell it to financial planners to use it with their clients. And I, I realized, you know, over after 29 years that we hadn't become Apple, right? That not everybody was buying the software, even though it's very easy to run and can make you money quite safely uh, in most cases, uh, or help you see how you can do that, that most people wanted to just be told what to do. So then I said, well, I've I run them this uh, program a zillion times for a lot of people. Let me just use it to write a book. Let me just uh, use it as a back, background to write this book, Money Magic. And so in Money Magic, I don't really talk much about the software except at the very beginning, but I basically use everything I learned. Uh, I try and dump everything I learned for the last 30 years about personal finance into that book. And there's really magical ways. It's called Money Magic because the software can find safe ways to raise your living standard, like Roth conversions, like, um, and I'm talking about finding out exactly how much and whether it actually is in your interest to do a Roth conversion by this magnet, but of this magnitude at this time, or whether to wait for uh, to 70 to take social security or how to take, uh, if you're a widow, whether to take your widow benefit or your retirement benefit first, all these things, or whether to downsize your home, does it pay you? How much can your living standard go up if you do that? And if I move from Massachusetts where there's a high income tax to, to Texas where there's none, all these things can be done, can be figured out now with software where it doesn't have to be a guessing game. And, and these calculations are far too complicated for the human mind. So I felt as an economist that we were spending too much time as a profession describing people's mistakes as opposed to prescribing financial penicillin. And that's what, why I developed the software and then wrote the book. That's the back uh, backstory to the book. You got it. There, there's so much great stuff in there. Uh, one thing that you talked about this idea of uh, smoothing the consumption spending, right? Uh, saying that not only would you prefer to spend kind of the right amount over time instead of being, like you said, you know, maybe poor today, rich tomorrow, and, and vice versa. Uh, one part of it is just once you get to a certain level of spending and, and, and income, and consumption is really the best word for it, but once you get to a certain level, it doesn't feel good to go back. Uh, it doesn't feel to go go back down uh, from there. And so a thing that you focused on in your book is increasing that that floor, that minimum standard of living to say, you know, there's a lot of regret. There's a lot of downside if you're trying to do something and next thing you know, you don't have enough money. Uh, and so taking actions that increase kind of the worst case scenario or increase what you call the, the floor, the minimum standard of living for you. What are a couple ideas you might have there to say, how can people make things I guess more or less risky, make it less risky in a way that increases their standard of living. Yeah. I'll, I'll, so just, just for a, you know, kind of a intro into that response, into this response, when we do consumption smoothing in, in the software and in economic papers and our theory papers and all the, you know, all the work in finance, it's all within a lifetime budget. Now there's, there could be uncertainty about that, you know, your future earnings and all, all kinds of things, but the basic notion is that you have a lifetime budget and you have to live, your spending has to, uh, cannot exceed it when we properly, you know, present value everything. So our software is doing, in addition to consumption smoothing, lifetime budgeting simultaneously so that the smoothing is relative, you know, is affordable. The consumption that's being recommended, uh, spending that's being recommended 
is not only, not only stabilizing the living standard per household member, but also is, is affordable. You're not going to go broke in the process. Now, the upside, what you're talking about here, Jeremy, you're referring to is what we call upside investing. And we actually just rolled this out in the, in the software just this week. So the way it works is very simple. It's, and let me give you an analogy of how, how we, a lot of us go and play the casino when we go to Vegas. So the last time I went to Vegas, I checked in the hotel and then my wife and I, we took like 200 bucks, went into the, into the casino and we left our wallets back with the credit cards back in the hotel room. So that was our gambling money. And we didn't spend any winnings until we left the casino. And if we had, we lost everything, but had we made some money, we would have been able to raise our living standard because we would have added it to our, let's say we our other money safely invested, not invest in the casino. So here with, um, think about investing, let's say you're uh, 40 and you've got some money in the stock market and uh, some money you're going to be adding in the stock market. Maybe you can put some of your retirement account money contributions in there and you already have some in there and you have some money maybe outside your retirement accounts in the market. So the idea here is that the rest of your investments would be in, in something very safe like inflation index bonds. And that you have a plan whereby you say, I'm just going to let the money that's in the market and then I'm going to add to the market just ride. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to touch it. At age 65, between 65 and 70, I will, or 75, I'll say, I'll gradually withdraw and convert anything that's there into safe assets. Now, what this means is that you have, based on all the non-stock stock money and your labor income and everything else, Social Security is coming in, you can have a living standard base floor, a base floor to your living standard. And then when you start converting, when you do hit 65 and you start taking money out, whatever's there, every time you convert, you're converting into something safe. So now you can raise your floor. So this is a floor to your living standard with upside. So this is why we call this upside investing in the software. You can run it in the software. You can, if you put more in the market, you're going to have a lower floor, but a higher upside. If you put less in the market, you have a higher floor, but a lower upside. And the very interesting thing is that because you're letting the thing ride and you're not withdrawing from it through time and not when you withdraw at the wrong time, you can be withdraw right before the market goes up. And that generates what's called sequence of return risk. So this is like for from 40 to 65, no sequence of return risk because you're not taking anything out. And so the sequence in which you get returns doesn't matter whether you get a high return now or a return tomorrow versus the other way around. You're still going to end up with the same pile of money, pot of money at 65. So the interesting thing when you actually see is that um, you can put a relatively small amount of money into the market, like 20% uh, of your assets rather than in the stock market, rather than 80%, and still have a very high up, upside and still have a pretty good floor. So you can have a pretty high floor and a very good upside. It's not going to be enormous upside like you would have if you put 80% in the stock market. But for most middle-class people, I think they're going to see this tool and, and play with it and uh, realize that I don't need to have that much in the stock market to be in the stock market in a significant way with respect to my future living center. But, but the whole idea is my, my base, I'll never have a living center that's below my base. I floored my living center. Now, the uh, financial community, Wall Street is into helping you bucket into bucketing strategies, which is trying to floor your income. They say, well, hold some cash for the short run, hold medium term bonds for the long middle term, medium, medium term and stocks for the long term because the stocks are safe in the long term, medium term bonds are safe in the me medium term. None of that is true. None of that bucketing strategy is complete nonsense. I mean, the stock market is riskier the longer you hold stocks. It's not, it does have a trend, okay? And if you're not taking out of it, you'll be riding that wave that's upward sloping. So you'll be getting on average, and most of the time you're gonna do quite well, but there will be some times when you don't do that well, but with this strategy, you can't do worse than your base living standard because you're not you're not spending your money in the, your winnings in the casino before you leave the casino. You know, imagine you're sitting at the roulette table, you 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 win something, and then you start ordering a Cadillac or whatever, right there on the tel, you know on the credit card on the on your uh, on the internet. You buy a car, 
presuming that you're going to make a killing the rest of the night at the casino. And then you leave the casino with no money and you've got this Cadillac you couldn't afford or whatever, Lexus or Tesla. So that's what people don't do. So we're trying to let them play the market the way they really want to, want to which is to preserve their living standard and just have upside. Yeah. And you're referring to investing, which you're, you're right on. People go into the casino, they all have their, their system. They have their way they go about it. You, you and I take a little bit more planning on investing in your own financial picture beyond just the, the, the one trip to the, the casino. And, and you're giving people that plan and you're doing things in the book, talking about how can you increase your standard of living that doesn't even have to do with investments, things like prepaying your mortgage or doing those Roth conversions at the right time or optimizing social security at the, the right time. What's great. And you could just go to your website without buying the book. You can buy the book. You should buy the book. And actually I'll tell you right now, Larry, the, and everyone listening, the first five people that email into me, I will send them the book. So email me, Jeremy at KyleFP.com, J-E-R-E-M-Y at K-E-I-L-F-P.com. Let me know that you listen to the episode. I will send you the book, but everyone else will give you the link and even just go to Larry's website, kylakoff.net. And you've got these financial shockers that are featured in Money Magic. Not, not all of it has to do with investing. A lot of people think economy and my finances, all it has to do is with picking the right stock. And there's so many things in there. And, and that's why you call them money magic, kind of secrets of, you know, you can get a, uh, a college degree at one school that's worth more than at the other school. And yet you paid so much more at the other school. You could be a plumber and make more money than a doctor over your lifetime. These are things that people don't, don't know about because they haven't uh, modeled it out. They haven't thought about it in the uh, economics-based financial system, the way that you've, you've gone and done that. And it's just a, a great way to go through and learn about how money and the economy kind of really works as opposed to um, a lot of assumptions. People like, like to make a lot of assumptions of, of, well, let me just go to uh, this school and let me become this career and everything's going to work out. Yeah. Uh, so I talk, um, I think the first chapter is called my daughter, the, the plumber. It used to be my son, the doctor, mm -hmm. the standard phrase. Um, so there's something in the air for every generation. And it's also, you know, parents can buy it for their kids or grandparents can buy it for their grandkids. Uh, but, but grandkids can buy it for their grandparents who might be making big mistakes on social security decisions. Like, you know, if you're a 62 mm -hmm. year old widow, you could easily lose several hundred thousand dollars by just checking the wrong box mm -hmm. apply or having some, some clerk at social security, some staffer at social security, because they don't know what they're doing. I literally check a box and deprive you. I discussed in the book that social security's inspector general a couple of years ago came out with a report saying that social security itself had defrauded 13,000 widows of $130 million through this practice of checking the box inappropriately. And I've been writing about this for literally, uh, you know, before the report came out and, and uh, more recently, it's, it's just horrendous how we've been treating, how the system has been treating people, a lot of whom are very poor. You know, most widows are not well off and mm -hmm. of systematically and having an inspector general and then not do anything about it for, for uh, what is now four years, just horrendous. So yeah, there's, there's all kinds of, yeah. I mean, that, that's not really anything having to do with economics-based planning. That's about knowledge about social security. I had to learn a lot of rules about social security, you know, mm -hmm. whether the software, and that's why, you know, in the process, I learned uh, how people are getting screwed in different ways. Yeah. I think that's where I first got introduced to you. It's from your, your book on social security and that you have a, a, a software program to help people figure out social security. And then you have the, the financial planning uh, system as well, too. One thing you said earlier is we can tell you the value of these decisions. Uh, what's, what's so interesting about this, I'll, I'll tell you a few stories here because we get to talk to clients and people all the time and I'll hear all the time. Well, it's not worth this, whatever this is, you know, working longer, waiting on social security, you know, whatever it is. And we might say, well, how much is it worth to you? Uh, and they, one, they, they've never calculated out and two, they don't know. So your system will calculate out, well, here's what your decision is worth. And then you can make a better, more informed decision. Another thing that people say, like, you know, what if you do retire this year or next year, or you take social security uh, four years down the road? 
they'll say, you know, what are the odds I'll actually live that long to make it worthwhile? Well, those are things like we can literally tell you the value. We can literally tell you the odds of, of what your longevity might be. And, and people are flying blind into these biggest decisions of your life. You've got a great analogy about going into the grocery store, throwing things in the cart. Do you mind just, just sharing that analogy real quick? Cause people would not go into a decision-making process that doesn't matter too much. And yet they're doing the same thing, flying blind in the biggest decisions of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. So economics based financial planning, unlike conventional planning, uh, which has got all kinds of problems and it has no connection to what we recommend is about consumption smoothing, about raising your, that level of your living standard at smooth living. So raising your living, smoothing your living standard, raising it, pricing lifestyle decisions. Like if I retire early, if I get divorced, if I, uh, send my kid to this very expensive school versus this one, what does it mean to my, my living standard? Uh, so, and can, is it affordable? And then also understanding your living standard risk associated with risky investing and aggressive spending. So anyway, but we're talking about here is um, the issue of pricing lifestyle decisions. And if you imagine to understand the importance of that, imagine going to a grocery store where you, uh, where there were no prices marked at all for anything you're buying and you had a cart. So as soon as you put $100 worth of groceries into the cart, it would charge your credit card. And so you're going through and you're, you have no idea what things cost. You're putting stuff in the cart, bingo, it's charged. You walk out of the store with $100 worth of groceries, but not $100 worth of value because you bought things that are too expensive that you wouldn't have bought, otherwise bought. And you don't buy enough of things that were cheap because you don't know what they cost. So it's the same thing here. When you make a decision about retiring early or late, uh, you need to know what it means in terms of if I retire three years early, how much will that lower my permanent living standard? Will it be 5% or 20%? If I, if I get divorced from Frank and you know I, I hate Frank to the tune of 15% of my living standard, if, if I don't have to have suffer a more than 15% reduction in my living standard, I'll divorce Frank. But then you do the calculation, you find out it's 30%. Well, then you figure out how to live with Frank and, uh, and not get divorced. We have to make these decisions in the context of understanding what it costs buying that big boat or taking the trip around the world. Can I really afford it? Can I afford to send my kid to BU, which costs about you know, 75,000 a year if you don't have the discounted price? Most kids get a discount, but a lot of, a lot of middle-class kids you know, in our t- tough situation because their parents aren't poor enough for them to get the, the grants and uh, scholarships that they'd otherwise get. So these decisions have to be made in the context of knowing the prices. So, so economics-based planning figures out prices in terms of your living standard. And we economists think we can put a price on everything and including whether to have another child, how much will that lower my living standard? You think, you know, that, that's, um, you know, can I afford that child? That's a question people are asking all the time, but if you don't have the, it's a very complicated question to figure out. You can't figure it out in your brain. You can't figure it out in Excel. It would take you 30, 29 years and a whole team of expert engineers like I've assembled over the years to get the right answer. And then you, you know, unless you really knew how to do the, the algorithms under the hood, you wouldn't get there after 29 years just to answer that question. But now you can answer the question in half a second with the software. Literally a half a second. Yeah, it's great stuff, and that's why you you took that 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 engine. You got a vastly powerful economics based financial planning engine, and you made sure that there's people that can can get a hold of it and learn. I guess the key takeaways. So you can go to your website, get the financial shockers, and then once you're blown away, which you will be when you look those, uh, read the book, and I'll tell you exactly the decisions that you ought to be going through and making and, and the values, you know, how do you price something? And it's, it's weird to say, how do you price a divorce? But people are making decisions on divorce or having another kid or switching their jobs. And they're missing out on one of the biggest factors, which is what is it going to cost you uh, even down to dollars and cents? And instead of throwing your hands up in the air, you've got kind of a framework. You've got even a, a system that will help you figure out what it might cost you. And, and that's just going to help people make better decisions. Uh, yeah. I mean, when you get divorced, you have to you know, lose all those economies of shared living. You have to have twi- you know, two heating systems, 
probably you know two two TVs, two ACs, two washing machines. Uh, you can't share the leftovers. There's all that, and then uh, so that's very expensive. And then um, two homes, two rent pit, rent checks. So extremely expensive and people are making these decisions without knowing what it, what it costs, right? Half the people divorcing. And then the other thing is I talk about, if you are going to get divorced, how to do it without getting, going to war with your, with your, uh, to be spout X. Mm-hmm. And so there's a chapter about getting divorced, like an economist, which is to, to figure out, don't start arguing over every little detail. Who's going to get, uh, the dog or whatever. Um, or how the dog sharing is going to work, that can come. But the the big issue is, what's a fair ratio of living of living standard between you and your your spouse when you're divorced? If maybe your spouse is working, you've been married thirty years, you're both retired. Maybe then the answer is you should both have exactly the same living standard, and you make the details of the arrangement, the division of the assets, and so forth, and uh, adjustments of alimony to make sure that happens. But if one spouse is working, 90 hours a week and the other person's not working and they're going to work for another 10 years. Maybe that person who's working should have a higher living standard relative to you. But once you figure out that ratio, then it's very easy within the software to come up with a deal. Now you're working together because you want to raise both of your living standards to find ways that will maximize since they're locked together in, in locks, you know, by one proportion of the other, then if you can raise one, you'll raise the other. And so that's how an economist would get divorced. You figure out the ratio of the living standard going forward that's fair. If you can agree on that, then everything else is is simple. You don't have to hire lawyers and have them fight and bill you forever. And I've seen horrendous cases with friends who've spent absolute fortune they couldn't afford. And then their kids aren't talking to one of the parents. It's just terrible to have that. So there's a better way to go on this. Yeah, and it just shows how uh, these emotional decisions are can can blind you from the different costs, the different values, and having a having a way to value that and go through and say, okay, well, what, how are things? How are my decisions going to impact me? That's just going to give you a, a better opportunity to make good decisions. There, I got a feeling I'm going to tell you my tagline, which I usually end with, but I'm going to tell it with you till you right now. I think you're going to like it. It's with we believe if you know more about your money you will feel better about your money and you will make better money decisions. I'm guessing you're liking that. Tell, tell me that's true. <laughs> that's hundred percent true. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Well, Larry, I appreciate you coming on the show. I've been a fan and read a lot of your works over many years. Uh, how can people get a, a hold of you? Well, I think the best way is kotlikoff.net. You can uh, join my, get my newsletter. You can uh, see where the different software websites um, where we have this very inexpensive, very user-friendly software that really can help people. I mean, if if people don't make uh, thousands of dollars by using uh, maxify.com, then they haven't tried hard enough because it's, and it could be hundreds of thousands depending on their situation. It's it's really, uh, because nobody can be optimizing without something, you know, some, it's just too complicated to be getting the things right on your own by accident. So un, too unlikely. And then, uh, it, you know, all the books and all the articles I've written are posted at kotlikoff.net and I write lots of columns uh, in addition to my newsletter that are posted. So um, I just hang out at kotlikoff.net and see what's there. Yeah, that's a, a, a good place to go. Thank you, Larry, for coming on the show. And thank you for listening to the Retirement Reveal podcast. Larry says it's true. And we believe if you know more about your money, you will feel better about your money and you will make better money decisions. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Revealed podcast. Click on the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit retirement-revealed.com to learn more. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Kyle Financial Partners. Kyle Financial Partners does not provide legal, accounting, or tax advice. Consult your attorney or tax professional. Representatives have general knowledge of the Social Security tenants. For complete details on your situation, contact the Social Security Administration. Kyle Financial Partners is a part of the Thrivent Advisor Network, a registered investment advisor. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. 
The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.